Ryan was always the life of the party. He was fun and he was charismatic. I think he could do any sport he wanted to do and it was always fun to watch him play. To be in the stands and hear this giant crowd yell, we thought, oh, this guy is, is headed for glory. <laughs> He just loved sports from immediately, it seemed. Ryan was a fun little brother. He was confident, sometimes cocky. All the girls liked him. All the guys wanted to be like him. My name is Ryan. At 17 years old, my life was literally broadsided by a dump truck. I actually was able to walk away from that crash, but my life as I knew it ended that day on that asphalt. baby of nine kids and so growing up as the baby of a very large family is in my opinion it's the best. He was a very strong-willed youngest child. And a lot of times my mom would say you know I'd ask to go play with friends and she'd say well you can go but you have to bring Ryan and I was like ah all right I had to bring my little brother but then as he grew up and as he matured and we became closer friends. I was the one following him and his friends around because I got along with his friends really well. We, we have kind of the same group of friends. Time to uh, torment these characters with, um, well, markers. It was always fun to, to have a little brother who you're also very close with, you're a very close friend with. This concludes our <laughs> session of drawing on Ryan and his friends. My life growing up was, was sports. Going into my senior year, I decided to play football. And of course, because Ryan is freakishly athletic and seemed to be good at everything, he walked on the team and immediately was, was one of the best players. It was crazy to hear about Ryan playing football and doing so well that in his walk-on senior season, he tied the school's record for interceptions in a single season. And I remember I was just on top of the world, like life couldn't get any better. I was doing great at football, I had amazing friends, and then my dad makes my childhood dreams come true by buying me a Kawasaki Ninja ZX636. I remember on Tuesday before our first playoff game, I'm driving home and I get to the light at Gilbert and Southern and a car pulls up next to me and the guy kind of revs his engine at me. And I look forward, the light's green because he had started to go. I go, I just felt like a big impact. I heard a sound and I looked up and I saw a guy in the air, like horizontal, parallel with the ground, sort of spinning for a little bit. And then, and then he hit the ground. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, that guy looks like Ryan. And that motorcycle looks like that green motorcycle that he just got. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that is Ryan. That is the motorcycle he just got. And then I just like started standing up off the sidewalk and I had no idea what was going on. I was like, what in the world? Like I was in the middle of the road though. So I jogged to the sidewalk. 
The guy's like, yeah, you just got hit by a dump truck. Look over there. And I looked over at my motorcycles in pieces. If you would have seen that intersection right after the crash, you would have just assumed that that guy had died, whoever, whoever got hit by that truck. My life as I knew it, my happiness was gone. I cracked my kneecap, so football was out of the question. So I was super depressed. A couple weeks after I get hurt, there was a dance party and one of my friends invited me to go and I didn't want to go because I was super depressed. And so he was like, they give you any painkillers? Take like three or four of these and like, you'll be all right. You'll have a good time, like just trust me. And so being naive like I was, I took the three or four pills and I go to the dance party and I had the best night. I forgot about my knee. I forgot about the fact that everything that I knew was over basically, like the depression was lifted. I remember telling my friend, I'm like, I feel like I am on top of the world. And he's like, yeah, he's like, you're high. And I was like, what? Like, I'm high? At that moment, the addict was born where I was like, oh, I can get high and still like control myself. After that party, I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol and a new Ryan had been born. So this was the first place you purchased pills? Yeah. That were like not prescribed by a doctor? Yep. When Ryan first got into drugs, I was actually away on my mission. I was serving in Detroit, Michigan. And so I had no idea what he was getting into. And unfortunately, I wasn't there to kind of be the older brother and be like, hey, what are you doing? Cut that out. Like I enjoyed it at first. It was it was a great time. You know, I had I had fun, but it was just like a slippery slope of doom. After my second treatment, I remember people talking about using heroin and the time came where I couldn't get um, pills and heroin was available and I was so sick and they told me it would take my withdrawals away and so I used the heroin. And then it was heroin from there on out because the heroin was so much cheaper and it did, there was a much stronger effect. For me and for the people that, that I know, they like 99, like nine out of 10 of them that started using pills ended up on heroin. I will say it's crazy now to go back, now that Ryan's clean and that his mind is clear to be able to drive through our city and to talk to him about places where he lived when he was either homeless or where he was you know, picking up drugs or even uh, flying a sign at a freeway exit when he was in the thick of his addiction. I had sold my phone for drugs. <laughs> That's the pay phone that I would have to come over and uh, call on. Back when pay phones existed. <clears throat> yeah. Now they're just Red Bull can holders. Exactly. <laughs> if you would have told the 16 year old Ryan where he would be at 25 and what he'd be going through, like there's no way I would have believed you. Right here where I spent hour after hour sitting in front, of, like before this Amazon thing was here, just sitting here waiting for the dealer to show up. Riding the bus over here and getting on the bus and people moving away from me because I was that guy on the bus that had such bad body odor. That as we began to realize how serious Ryan's addiction was and how hard it would be to get him out of it, there was nothing we didn't try. He wanted to be free from this addiction, but also there was part of him, of course, that was controlling his brain where, that, that he wanted so desperately to just continue to get high. And so the struggle is how do we help this side of him, the part that wants to be clean, uh, to, to win this battle? And I remember somebody telling me, hey, Ryan's just gonna have to hit rock bottom. When you're told that the best thing to do is let them hit rock bottom and that you shouldn't enable them in any way. And that when they came to your home begging that you had to turn them out, that was the hardest thing in the world. And to this day, I pray for those that are in that situation. The addicts that want to get well and their family doesn't know how to help them, what to do. After trying so many different things to try to help Ryan, uh, even at one point it was like, well, maybe what he needs is for us to just 
leave him be. If he wants to keep getting high, let him keep getting high and just say, okay, you know, if that's what you want to choose, then, you know, there, there's nothing we can do. Which meant um, Ryan was homeless. This upsetting picture was just sent to me and was very distraught and shocking. I was headed down that same path and I'm thankful for the life I have and the people who have helped me. Never give up, because you're worth it. If anyone can help him, please do. Unfortunately, I cannot. That was from a friend of Ryan's on Facebook. I didn't realize that it could ever get that bad, that he'd ever be willing to let it get that bad or that, that it was even a, a possibility. It was right at that time that I was talking to one of his friends and telling him about that sign and about how we felt. And he said, there, there isn't such thing as rock bottom. Rock bottom will be that Ryan will die. And if you don't go get Ryan, if you don't pick him up, if you don't intervene, you will lose Ryan. So then the question becomes, how do you get a hold of someone who's an addict and doesn't have a phone? Well, in our case, the only thing we could think to do was to get a hold of his drug dealer. Finding that out and then thinking, I am calling a drug dealer to find my son. Who would have ever thought that sweet little baby that I held in my arms would suddenly be dependent on a drug dealer? living in squalor. I remember going to pick up for my dealer and him telling me that my family was trying to get a hold of me. And I was like, no, like, they don't want to hear from me. He's like, no, they're trying to get a hold of you. And I remember finally calling my mom and my sister meeting me and taking me to detox. I couldn't believe that my brother my brother was homeless. My brother was sleeping on a, a random mattress. And his friend was right in saying that um, we would have lost Ryan if we hadn't have intervened. Where are we going? Uh, so we're going to Community Bridges now. I remember Sherry picking me up, but that's the intake door right there. You go through right in there. You have to until you can get into a bed to go into the crisis unit in there. You have to be in there for 24 hours. This cycle of Ryan goes detox, rehab, relapse, detox, rehab goes on for 10 years. And I, um, I've probably been to detox like 30 to 50 times. And, um, and I've been to inpatient rehab 15 times now. There was a time actually, a six year period of my use where I had spent more time in inpatient rehab than out of it. I just kept thinking something is going to work. It will work sometime. This last time around, I was, I was worn down. I was homeless yet again. I was driving my car to areas where I knew no one knew where I was and getting high in hopes that if I overdosed that I would actually die so that no one would find me and I didn't because I didn't want to be revived. I've been DNR'd from the Salvation Army, can never go back there unhooked. I've been DNR'd from there because I've been there like four or five times and so I thought that I didn't have any resources and so I called Granite Mountain which is the rehab up in Prescott and they called them and they told me that they had, they had a bed available right away. I've been to rehab 15 times. I got, I got like 17, 18 months clean now. Is there anything that you can point to like to that? What made the difference from the first 15 times to this one? It, it was an accumulation of doing it so many times so I knew what to do, but I just set, so, I, I set all the correct boundaries and I gained a real relationship with God. I, I had to rely on like prayer a lot while I was in there. I just believed that I actually could do it. I, I had a sense that it was like, my last shot like they're like I can't be doing this anymore like I'm so sick of it you know, learning everything that I learned and knowing what I knew and knowing where my shortfalls were um, helped me this time to stay clean giving my mom all my finance my paychecks go to my mom allowing my brother to drug test me whenever and anytime and every time I, I set up all these roadblocks that made it so that I couldn't get out of line
Where my life's at now is a total dream to me. I wake up in it and I have a bed that I'm sleeping in and I show up to work and they can count on me. It's been so good to see him interact with my family. We feel like we have Uncle Ryan back. It just makes our family complete. I'm, I'm just grateful that I get to see my family and I get to be with them because like for 10 years, that's all I wanted, you know. Hope has never been gone, ever. I always knew that he would make it someday. I don't have a lot right now compared to most people, but for me, I'm living a dream. I spend time with my family. I have a motorcycle, like I have my dream truck. I have my, my best friend is back in my life. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. This can sometimes be a heavy topic for people to, to address. And it's not something that, you know, you want to talk about all the time, but that's kind of the purpose of the vlog and, and what's so cool about you being willing to share what you've been through, why it's unique. And I just want to say how proud I am of Ryan for not only coming out of addiction, but being willing to share his story and everything that he's been through. So the purpose of this vlog is to not only share my story, but to share the stories of many others that have suffered through addiction and alcoholism. Doing that, we can hopefully prevent people from ever getting into addiction. And also to talk about ways that like the, the family members can help out, that they can be there for uh, people who are struggling with addiction. And lastly, we want to give hope to those that are still struggling in addiction, that recovery absolutely is possible. You can do this.